Good evening, everyone. Bishos de Mardasra. It is an incredible and overwhelming schos, Baruch Hashem, to be here with all of you tonight. And I want to thank this, the Rav, the Rabbitson, the entire community, for hosting such a beautiful Simchas HaTorah in what is clearly an overwhelming and difficult time. You know, when we have to think about things, should we dance, should we not dance, simcha, not simcha, so you know that something has occurred that hits to the very essence, that hits to the very neshama of the Jew. Because the Jew's default natural disposition is one of simcha, and not just any simcha, but exuberant simcha. And when we have to think about how to navigate even a Simcha Satora, I think it shows us the enormity <coughs> of the events that we are witnessing and the enormity of the times that Klal Yisrael is weathering. It's a great schos, Bar Hashem, to be here in Eretz Yisrael during this time. And one of the visits that we had, and I want to thank Rabbi Glasser and the leadership of the OU, for really organizing this trip. It's been uh, transformative. I was very uncomfortable whenever people thanked us for coming, as it felt very empty. It was a great, not that, not that the expression was empty, but it felt strange for us to be the recipient of people's praises for getting on an airplane and staying at a hotel. Not that much Mesir Nefesh in the hotel, whatever, but you know, not, not that much Mesir Nefesh involved on our part. And one of the most incredible things, and it's a feeling that I only realized once I got here, is that there was something that I was feeling since Shmini Atzeres, since that Shabbos morning, when, you know, the Medrash says that when the Mabul came, the Mabul, the flood of Noah, affected every single land except Eretz Yisrael. And on Shmini Atzeres, it felt like there was a Mabul and it only affected Eretz Yisrael. And for those of us in the diaspora, going two days and not knowing what was happening, getting a little bit of information here, a little bit of information there, no one really had a full picture, but we were even a little bit more disconnected. And I realized that all this time, I've been experiencing a profound feeling of disconnect. And it was only once we landed in Ben Gurion with all of our duffel bags, which we had to lie to customs on two sides of the ocean. <laughs> that for the first time since the overwhelming events of Shemini Atzeres, we finally felt some greater level of connection. Because the only thing worse than suffering is suffering alone. And that we were processing and digesting everything that happened to our people but we were processing and digesting it from 6,000 miles away, exacerbated and amplified the pain that we were experiencing. So it is a schos, Baruch Hashem, to be here with all of you tonight. It would have been a schos just to have dinner with all of you wonderful people. And the schos is compounded by the fact that we get to celebrate a siyum, the fact that we get to celebrate Torah together. We hope that all of the Torah learned tonight, Hashem Yerat Hashem, be a schos, for all of our precious soldiers, they should emirat Hashem be matzliach. Kodesh Baruch Hu should give them the incredible siyata d'shmaya, the oz, the gvura, to recognize that they are not just fighting the fight of Am Yisrael, but this is humanity's fight of good versus evil. And it is the schos of Am Yisrael to be the tip of the spear in humanity's fight of good versus evil. It's your children who are the tip of the spear in this incredible melchama of Tov versus Ra, of Ar versus Choshech. And just know that even though we may not know each other, and even though our communities may be separated by thousands of miles, not a day goes by that we don't daven for your children. Not a day goes by that we don't learn in the merit of our precious soldiers. And not a day goes by that we don't daven for each of you to have the incredible strength to have the wisdom, to have the fortitude, to have the hope, and to have the optimism, to be able to weather these difficult times in Amir Hashem, make it towards the beautiful Geula that awaits all of us. It's also 
a little bit difficult to get up and speak after two masterful speakers. And I'm the only thing standing between you and dessert. So you put all of that together, this is not exactly the coveted spot. <laughs> but I want to tell you just something a little bit about Yorav, about Yamar Asra. So my Balabat know in my shul that I, I am a big arm twister. Not about most things, really just about learning. Feel again, everyone has to have a yomi. Everyone has to do something. And there was one guy in my kahila who I've been working on for a very long time to get him to learn daf yomi. He has the ability to do so. He has the time. He has the flexibility. And for months and months, every time I would see him, I would always hack him. You know, it's time to begin to learn the daf. And Baruch Hashem, we have a beautiful shir every single morning. And Baruch Hashem, an online community as well. I told him, okay, you can't make it at 5.45 in the morning. Don't worry. You can get it on YouTube. You can get it on a podcast. There's plenty of opportunities to learn. But I said, there's really no excuse. It's going on for a couple of weeks. Probably about a, ma- a month into this exchange, he comes over to me. He says, Rabbi, I just want to tell you. Okay, I started. I started Dafyomi. I said, fantastic. This is incredible. So... What are you listening on? And he looked down. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh no, it's not with you. <laughs> it's with Rabbi Rosner. <laughs> I said, Ribbono Shalom, thank you for the lesson in Anovo. Okay, wonderful, <laughs> good. But Baruch Hashem, I'm sure all of you know in this incredible community that you are blessed with the Rav who is a combination of not just both a Sinai and an Oker Harim, both someone who is a repository of an immense, immense amount of information, someone with profound koach of analysis, but also a Balmidos Tovos, who is truly just the model of what a Jew is supposed to look like. You don't really need me to say anything. The truth is you heard from your Rav, you heard from Rabbi Glasser. If you learn from your Rav, listen to your Rav, I guarantee you anything and everything you need to know to be successful in life, you will have. So I'll just share with you something short, and then Amir Tzah Hashem, allow, allow the evening to progress. There's an incredible Gemara in Meseches Brachas. The Gemara says, Minolan Dishma Garam. How do you know that a name is important? The Gemara captures, the Gemara is talking about the idea that a name, fascinating part about a name, is that a name captures the essence of an individual. When you look at a person's name, you could see the entirety of who they are, what they are, where they come from, where they're going, all in their name. And that's why, interestingly enough, name changes are something incredibly dramatic. Generally, contemporarily, we reserve name changes for when? For when? Again, Rahman al someone is in a very, a very precarious situation. And again, it's just a difficult, difficult outlook or difficult road ahead. So we change the name. The hope is you could change the mazel. That's the power of a name. That a name represents a mazel. A name represents a destiny. A name represents a certain almost like bucket of shefa, of divine bracha, of divine blessing, of divine energy. So when you want to change the trajectory of a person's life, you change their name. But of course, we know that in Sefer Bereshis, the Torah is filled with incredible name changes. But they're not name changes because something bad has happened, just the opposite. They're name changes in order to open the door to something incredible. So just last week, <laughs> The Shalom changes Avram Avinu's name and changes it ultimately again from Avram, which Rashi HaKadosh explains, Avaram, he was a man who had an influence over a much smaller regional area. And the extra A, the extra hey, Av Hamon Goyim, Avraham, father of a multitude of nations, representing the idea that Armavinu would impact not just a community and not just a region, but mankind in its entirety. And the Arizal in Sharha Gilgulim says something amazing. I want to quote you. The Arizal writes, Shiyesh l'chol echad ve'echad shnei shemos. Every single person has two names. There's a name that you have. It's the name that you're given by your parents. For a boy, it is bris. For a girl, again, by the Kriyasa Torah, depending on the meaning of the community. That's the name you get from your parents. That name is inspired by Ruach HaKodesh. You know, parents have to give their child a name which captures the entire destiny of a child. 
And for a girl, you might know this baby for a couple of hours. For a boy, maybe you have eight days. But how are you supposed to give your child a name that represents the destiny? It's an aspirational desire for what you want your child to become. The kochos of your child. The Arizal says, parents are given Ruach HaKodesh. They're given a degree of prophecy to be able to give their child just the right name. So there's one name. There's one name that says the Arizal, which represents during the Shema HaKadosh, which represents all of the good, all of the beauty, and all of the holiness you possess. But listen to what he writes. There's another name that each of us have. And it's my broken name. It's the name of all of the things that are broken inside of me. Each person says the Arizal has two names. Your given name, which is the name that represents your holiness, the name that represents your potential, the name that represents, again, your abilities and your destiny. And then there's a name which represents all of the things that are broken inside of you. Because, dear friends, we all have things that are broken inside of us. We all have things that are in disrepair and urgent need of repair. There's a second name. Darizal then goes on to explain that the whole essence of life is to discover what is your broken name. What's my broken name? Because the entire avoda in life is to identify the things that are broken, to identify the things that are in a state of disrepair, and to fix them. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I'm not just simply here to do good. I'm not just here just for the assay tov. But ultimately, really what I'm here is to fix the things that are broken. Two names. One for the positive spiritual dynamic energy that each of us possess, and one representing the things that are all broken. But there's a third name also. That Rizal doesn't discuss a third name, but there's a third identity. The third identity is actually mentioned in this week's parish. The Torah opens, Vayira Elav Hashem. The Ribbon Shalom appears to Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is post Brismila, and the Ribbon Shalom appears to him, like Rashi says, to do the mitzvah bigger cholim, to visit the sick. And the great side of the Yitzhak Abraditch of Zechusa Yogin Alinu says something amazing. The Rebbe says, Why doesn't the Torah mention Avram Avinu's name? Vayera el Avram. Why Vayera elav Hashem? And Rabbi Yitzchak says something amazing. He says, sometimes a person could accomplish something so great that they outgrow their original name. Sometimes you could do something of such spiritual epic proportions that the name, the identity you had until it doesn't fit you anymore. And I believe Yitzchak's wording, he says the letters of your name, if you imagine each letter as a vessel, as a kli, they're there to go ahead and receive and retain the shefa, the divine energy that comes down. Well, sometimes a person reaches such a level and they've generated such divine energy flowing into their life that there are not enough kalim, not enough utensils in the letters of their name. Or that's why says, I believe Yitzchak, Vayir al-Armavinu gave himself a brismila. And at an advanced age, after doing everything that he did, Avram Avinu transcended his Avraham identity. Can you imagine this? He already went from Avram to Avraham. And by the beginning of Parashas Vayir, it says, Avram Avinu has a third identity. We call it a transcendent identity. It's that identity that you actualize when you surpass expectations. It's the identity that you actualize when not only do you go ahead and find out your kohos, but you dig down deep to find new kohos that you never knew you had. Each and every one of us has these three identities. My birth name, which represents the kohos and the destiny I have. My broken name, which represents the things that are in a state of disrepair. And my transcendent name. That's the person I am capable of becoming. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak says, most of us don't end up actualizing our transcendent identity. Most of us hover somewhere around our birth identity. But the Rebbe says, there's a whole new identity that's waiting for us. This whole new Vayera, a love identity that is waiting for each of us. So how do we actualize it? How do we actualize that transcendent identity? Because deep down, isn't that what we're looking to do? Deep down, I want to know that after 120, 
I didn't live an ordinary regular life. That after 120, I did something not just nice and good, but I did something magnificent. How do I actualize that transcendent identity? So I've been thinking a lot about this. And I think one of the answers, the truth is, is right here in Eretz Yisrael. I will tell you one of the things that strikes me so much since the war began is sometimes feel, and this is the perspective of someone living currently in Gullus, in the diaspora. But it struck me that like everyone in Eretz Yisrael has like a Superman identity. What do I mean by that? Do you remember Superman? You know, like he would write, he'd just pull back the shirt and there was like a new identity here. So it's incredible. Everybody's going about their lives and then war comes and everybody morphs into someone different. I was working on a project with a couple of people here in Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim. And on Matzah Yamtiv, Matzah Yamtiv for us had an email saying, Rabbi Silver, just gotta tell you, the project's on hold. Project's on hold. Um, I'm a mifakeid in the army. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna be out. I don't, I don't know how long I'm gonna be out. Two days ago, this guy was like a real estate tycoon, right? He's sealing deals, he's getting investors, he's this. The next thing I know, he's sending me videos with him really like yelling at people, right? Mamish, like taking these young soldiers, like, you know, get, getting them into, sh it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. How does one person morph into someone else? It's been incredible to see, just again, I've been watching this from a distance and now over the last couple of days, I've been able to see it here. How every single person that feels like here in the beautiful, beautiful state of Israel, has transformed themselves into something different. Whether you're a chesed organizer, whether you're a barbecuer, whether you're a food deliverer, whether you're a letter writer, right? Everyone has like these new skill sets, right? So again, three weeks ago, everyone had a day job. Three weeks ago, everyone was a regular person. And now you have all developed transcendent identities. You've all become someone else. You've all become someone else. Not someone else you thought of becoming, not someone else you plan to become, but ultimately, again, as someone else who is accomplishing things that you probably never thought you could or would have to accomplish. What's incredible for us to see in our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael is a Vayira, a love identity being actualized en masse. People surpassing birth identity and really holding on to an actualizing transcendent identity. But how does that happen? How do you transform into Superman overnight, which so many of you did? And I think, just one man's opinion, it's a result of Achtos, as the Rav Shlita mentioned before. You see, when everyone around you is becoming a heightened, more refined version of themselves, everybody's got to do it. The tremendous achtos that exists within Klal Yisrael now, the tremendous achtos. Now, earlier today, we were on a, an army base in Shlomit in the north, and I had an opportunity to share a few words. And I said to the, to the holy soldiers who were there, I said, you know, my greatest fear, when this war is over, after we are victorious, that what happens to the Achtos? What happens, after, what happens to the Achtos? Rav Shmuel Ilya was there. He said, don't worry, there'll be another war. I said, okay. I wanted to suggest something a little bit different, but he's Rav Shmuel Ilya, okay. What happens to the Achtos? Doesn't it feel great to be biyachad? Doesn't it feel great that when you walk down the street, suddenly it no longer matters what your opinions are about judicial reform? And by the way, this is spilling over into America as well. Suddenly again, barriers are coming down. Communities are uniting. People are coming together. It mamish is a be'ishachad belevechad. You know what we're discovering? My Rabbi Rabbi Willig always used to say, 
that the Torah doesn't say, Rashi doesn't say, Ish Echad, Gemara doesn't say, Ish Echad Bedea Echad. It doesn't say one people with one opinion. Because such a thing never happened and never will happen. But the incredible part that we're seeing is, you could have differences of opinion, but there could still be incredible achdos. How do we go ahead and actualize a transcendent identity? Dear friends, the first answer is achdos. When we are together, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. There's an energy, and there's an energy that is currently coursing through the collective heart of Am Yisrael. And it's pushing us, it's pushing us to be better, and it's pushing us to be greater, and it's pushing us to do more, and it's pushing us to learn more, and it's pushing us to do more chesed, and it's pushing us towards the road of Avaschinam, and it's pushing, and it's pushing, and it's pushing. And generally, we don't like to be pushed. But something incredible is happening is no one is pushing back. We're all going with the flow, the beautiful flow of Achtos. And that's the first way in which we actualize our transcendent identity. The second way, the second way, is through Torah. <coughs> what I mean is Rabbi Razner so beautifully read before, the last two lines of the Gemara. Such an interesting Gemara. The Gemara is talking about, again, as the Gemara said, Rabbi Nora, he said, I would leave beside, leave behind all the professions of the world and only focus on Torah. So the Gemara ends off by saying as follows. He says, he says if a person has a profession, shakal umno sheba olam, ein omedes lo ela bimei will do so. So the Pashib Shah, the Pasha understanding is, you have a profession, your profession is only yours as long as you could perform the job. So if you're a doctor, right, you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, as long as you have your mental faculties, you could do it. You're in construction, as long as you have some level of physical agility, you can do it. Even your Rav, your Rebbe, as long as you have some ability to convey or do something, you have it. You have to be able to actualize your career skill set in order to be able to do your desired job. When you get old, if your intellectual acumen is not there, Right? If your intellectual tools are not present, you're going to have a hard time performing the skills or performing the labor of your youth. Aval Torah ain't okay. Torah is not like this. Omedes lo la'odam be'es yal do so. Torah is there for you when you're young. Vinosenes lo achris v'tikva be'es ziknuso. Listen to the words of the Gemara. Torah is profound. Why? Vinosenes lo achris. It gives you hope for a future. V'tikva and hope. Be'ez ziknuso when you're old. So I guess the Pasha Pshat of the Gemara is that the beauty of Torah is that if you, you'll have it, and not only do you have it in this world, but you have it in the world to come. But perhaps there's another meaning of the Gemara. You know, the Bashem Tav HaKadosh says on the Pasuk, Al tashlicheni le'ez zikna. Such a profound statement. And the truth is, anyone who is either older or deals with the elderly knows that sometimes the hardest part of getting old is being forgotten about. It's being forgotten about. It's not being able to fend for yourself, being reliant on others, and if you're Zoha, to have beautiful and loving family around you, it's great. But not everybody has that. So he says, <laughs> Do not cast me out when I'm old. But the Bashan of says something amazing. He says, Zikna is not a biological stage. He says, what's a zakin? This is incredible. He says, what's a zakin? A zakin is someone who is set in his ways. A zakin is someone who says, this is it, love it or leave it. Right? This is who I am. This is what I am. This is my temperament. These are my middos. I am set in my ways and I am immovable. There's a lot of smiles as I'm saying this. I'm guessing there are some people like this. Right? I, I am set in my ways and that's it. That's zikna. That's zikna. Just resigning yourself that this is who I am, this is what it is, this is what life is, and it's unchangeable. Al kashlichini le'ez zikna means hakadosh baruch hu. Never let me fall into the mindset of thinking that I can't evolve, that I can't change, that I can't grow, that I can't develop a transcendent identity. And maybe that's the pshat in the Gemara. Do you know what the power of Torah is? Do you know what the power of Torah is? 
The Gemara says, this is now Baruch Hashem, the third cycle of Daf Yomi that I, have the, that I have the privilege to teach. In the last cycle, in the last cycle, I had a man in my shul who had never learned Torah before. This, this is not hyperbolic. He never learned Torah in his life. He didn't even follow him with Kriyasa Torah because of this Kiddush club. Hey, so he wasn't, right, he wasn't like, in other words, he wasn't, there was no Torah. There was no Torah. He was 71 years old. He decided, you know what? I'm going to learn. At his 80th birthday, he celebrated a Siyam Ashas. And at 80 and a half, he passed away. The power of Torah is that Torah changes you. We all know it. You know how you feel after you learn. And by the way, Rabbi Rosner might not like this, right? But by the Hasidim, there's the concept. Rabbi Nachman says, even if you don't understand what you're learning, it doesn't make a difference. Because maybe your mind doesn't understand it, but your heart, your neshama, understands everything. And so just when you learn, even if the mind says, I have no idea what's going on. And those of you who learn the daf know that there are absolutely days like that. I don't know what's going on. Truth is, I don't even know why I'm doing this. Right? I'm not sure what benefit there is for me, for Klal Yisrael, for the world. Right? Again, but you know what? What do you do? You power through. Why? Because even after that daf that you may not have understood, you still feel different. I'm a different person. That's the power of Torah, says Rabbi Noray. No senes lo achris. Torah says, al tashlichini le'ezikna. I could become someone different. I could become someone greater. I could become someone better. The tikva be'ezeziknuso. Suddenly again, I don't have to be the same person. But I have the ability to be like an Avram Avinu and develop a transcendent identity. And in reality, that's what we're celebrating here tonight. A double simcha. The simcha, Bar Hashem, finishing Masechta and finishing Seder Nashim, which is an overwhelming and beautiful and incredible accomplishment. But also we're celebrating the simcha of Vayera Elav Avram. Vayera Elav Hashem, excuse me. We're celebrating the simcha of recognizing that, yes, I have a broken identity that I need to fix. I have a birth identity that ultimately, again, I need to live up to. But I have a transcendent identity that I have not yet begun to truly tap into. But I can, because it's in the air. It's in the air. And if I tap into the Achdus of Klal Yisrael, that'll help me along the way. And if I tap into the Torah of Klal Yisrael, that'll help me along the way. That's the Simcha. That like Avram Avinu, who developed a transcendent identity, who became Avram, who became Avraham, became just a love, because he was too great for a name. We have the ability to reach that level of personalistic accomplishment as well. The opening Mishnah, the opening Mishnah in Maseches Kiddushin read, Ha'isha niknis begimel drachim. There are three ways that a person has the ability to affect Kiddushin. Kesef, shtar, and bia. So kesef, money, shtar, a document, and bia, intimacy. And the great Sadi Tifer Shlomo Shlomo Adam says that there is an incredible remez in this. The Rebbe says, Ha'isha niknis, isha, is Klal Yisrael. Is Klal Yisrael. Who's the Baal? Who's the husband? The husband is the Ribbon Shalolam. There are three ways or three times in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu has acquired us as his own. Kesef, the Rebbe says, that's a reference to Yetzias Mitzrayim. We left Egypt and Baruch Hashem, we left with Rechush Gadol, with great amount of wealth. Shtar, Remez Lagu'ulas Ezra, Sheshalach Igros Lebavel. Right? Ezra sent letters to the Babylonian community. It's time to come home. So again, Kesef, the first Gula of Mitzrayim. Shtar, the second Gula of Bayesheni. And Bia, says the Tefer Shlomo, is Bia's Goel, is the coming of Mashiach. We have been Zoha Baruch Hashem to be acquired by HaKadosh Baruch Hu in first two of the three ways. In Halabai. In the zechus of the Mesiras Nefesh of Klal Yisrael, in the zechus of all the sacrifices that we, 
and specifically you, the holy Jews of Eretz Yisrael, have had to make in the schus of acquiring our transcendent identity. May we be Zoha Mirz Hashem to the third and final stage of Kiddushin with the Ribono Shal Olam. May we Zoha Mirz Hashem to see the Geula, to see Trias Hamesim, to see the third base Hamikdash, and to see Mirz Hashem the Melech Hamashiach Mihir Rabbi Amenu. Amen. Amen.